morning, everyone. How are we this morning? Good. Well, amazing. It's um, it's very good to be home. Karen and I've been away for the last couple of weeks. We um, we're out in the states. We spoke at um, the youth conference for Life Church St. Louis. So out where Tom and Randy are, and Luke Tanner. You guys, remember Luke? And uh, Luke's the youth pastor there, and so we spent the weekend with them, teaching and preaching and having a lot of fun, playing music. And then uh, we went up to, drove up six hours and went to Morris Life Church with John and Ruth Horsfall. And uh, they had their first 360, and Dan was speaking there. Um, and then we got to have a day with Dan. And, um, and honestly, I wanted to just tell you guys, I've never seen Dan just so at rest. Um, it, was a, it was very nice to see so much going on and God's doing so much in St. Charles, but just very at rest, um, very much missing everyone here and uh, very much praying for you all and praying for us all, but Dan at rest, it was very nice to see. And uh, then we got a plane, we, we uh, flew up to Toronto and we spent a week teaching on the school of ministry in Toronto. And it was amazing because it's literally 10 years since we were at the school of ministry where we met at 18 and uh, so we had this, well, three, four days with the students there teaching, and it was so profound, just looking at these 18 or so of 25-year-olds thinking, wow, like, that was me. And I definitely thought that I knew absolutely everything there was to know about being a human and, and the world outside, and it was very humbling and very wonderful. Uh, so we got back just last Friday, missed you all very much, and it's very good to be home. I, um, I'm excited for this week because this is Holy Week. This is the week leading up to the central event that changed absolutely everything for everyone, for the rest of humanity's existence. Everything changed. And we're going to celebrate it on Sunday, the resurrection of Jesus. I used to be sort of confused about why the resurrection was such a big deal. I used to think we'd just keep talking about something that happened, like at Christmas, the feeling of like we're just talking about an ancient story until I realized Christmas was the recognition that God is with us, Emmanuel. And then Easter... Resurrection Sunday, I used to have that kind of thought growing up of like, nah, it's cool to like celebrate and sing songs about something that was and something that happened until I realized that the resurrection is something that is happening every single day and that we can involve ourselves in it every second of every minute of every day of every week of every month of every year of our lives. We can put ourselves in the way of the power of the resurrection. And next week we're going to celebrate that. But before we celebrate that, we have to recognize what this week means and its significance. So I think I'm right in thinking, Nigel, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but I think I'm right in saying that this is effectively the last Sunday of the Knowing God series. How have you found the series by way of cheer or applause or something? Yeah. Knowing God. Yeah, we spent, we spent the last three months, I think it is, more on this idea of just knowing God before we move on to growing in God. So next Sunday, we'll talk about a resurrection. The week after that, we're going to have Andrew Hughes. Anybody remember Andrew and Angela Hughes? They're amazing, real friends of the house. And um, Karen and I were actually at their church in February speaking at a conference. And they are just wonderful people who really do love God and His kingdom. And Andrew's going to be preaching. So two weeks today, kicking off the new series within a series, Growing in God. And it's very, very exciting. So I want to I want to spend today doing two things. I, I do want to kind of bring a conclusion to, um, or a final word, I'd say, to, to this series of knowing God. But I, I do want to do it out of where we are in the calendar of the church and in this point of Holy Week on Psalm, Psalm Sunday, Palm Sunday, sorry, and, and, and kind of pull from that. So I'm going to look at two texts today. And and the second text is going to be out of uh, Mark 11, uh, Luke 19. And we're going to look at the triumphal entry. We're going to begin, though, in Mark 12. So if you want to open your Bibles there, we're going to, we're going to get into it. Um, I've, I've called this sermon, has the same name as a, what I think would be a pretty cool name for a pub. It's called The Widow and the Lamb. And, um, and it really pulls out these two texts that talk about and exemplify and give, give real sort of um, exposure to two people a widow and Jesus. And um, there is so much that we can learn from these texts. Uh, I have been so challenged by four verses that I'm going to read out this morning, probably over the last two months. I mean, really challenged. I mean, like, saying to Kara, everything we do needs to change. <laughs> I mean, like, pulling my sort of rhythms and life apart to say, this changes everything if I really believe it and apply it. Are we ready to get into that kind of word this morning? All right, so Mark 12, uh, we're going to read from, we're going to go from verse 41. Um, before I do, I'm just going to share a very, very quick other word. And this is almost going to be like two minutes. I'm not going to do that preacher thing where I do a 20 minute intro. Two minutes. Over the last month or two, um, I've been able just to be at events throughout, throughout the church body that have been amazing just to give me a sort of 
window into so much of what's going on. I think in a week I, I went to, uh, we did children's church, we did youth, we did iconic, we did encore, we did Sunday mornings, uh, went to a couple of life groups. And everywhere I went, I could just see this, this sense within everyone, honestly, from the children to the not so children, uh, members of the church, this sense of there, there is a change coming. There's, there's a readjustment adjustment happening in people. People are no longer prepared just to get on with business as usual. You could say they're tired of business as usual. Um, they want to change. They want to switch it up. And I just felt like that's happening in the spirit. It's happening in the seasons, but it's happening in the spirit. People are hungry for something new. And not, not a new trend, but what God is doing, the new thing, right? Isaiah 43, 19, behold, I'm doing a new thing. Do not perceive it. And um, the other day, Kara and I were just chatting and praying, and this, this scripture came to mind, which is a scripture we know well, but I felt like I want to read this over the church, and I want to declare something with it. So this is, I'm reading out Song of Songs 2 verse 10. It says this, my beloved speaks to me and says, arise. Jesus speaks to us and says, arise, my love. That's how he addresses us. My love, my beautiful one, and come away. For behold, and some people need to hear this word, Behold, the winter is past. The rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. And the time of singing has come. The voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree ripens its figs and the vines are in blossom. They give forth fragrance. Arise, my love, my beautiful one, come. Lord, I thank you that the winter is past. Lord, I thank you that when we walk out onto the streets, we see the blossoming of trees. Lord, I thank you that this moment in our calendar marks both the welcoming of spring, but the acknowledgement that the resurrection changes everything. Lord, I thank you for the resurrection of passion, for the resurrection of prayer, for the resurrection of desire, for the resurrection of anticipation. I thank you for the end of boredom and cynicism. I thank you for the end of stinking thinking. I thank you for the end, Lord, of that which has held us back, dumbed us down, and kept us disinterested about life. Lord, I thank you that a new season is upon us, both in the physical and in the spiritual. And I thank you that this week marks the end of something and the beginning of something in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, cool. Mark 12, verse 41. Let's read this. I'm gonna read verse 41 to verse 44. The widow and the lamb. And he sat down, Jesus sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many people, rich people, put in large sums. And then a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more. Everybody say more has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in everything she had. She gave all she had to live on. From verse 43, one more time. And he called his disciples because he saw the widow and he said, truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of a abundance but she out of poverty has put in everything she had all that she had to live on I read those those verses four lines and I felt the Holy Spirit take hold of me this woman exposes so much within my soul and Jesus makes an example out of her and you got to find yourself in a text sometimes you have to find yourself in a story and people say to me why do you enjoy reading the Bible I say because it's a story I'm in not a textbook that I'm just learning from right it's a story we're in when Jesus the rabbi says come gather around I want to make a point and you read that you lean in and you say Jesus what am I going to learn right now you're not reading about something that happened you're reading about something that's happening right now 
And I read it and I heard Jesus say, disciples gather around, getting close. I need to tell you something. So I leaned in, I leaned in and he said, this woman has given more than everyone else. Why? I don't need to convince anyone in the room the pain and the, the travesty uh, of being a widow. We don't need to spend much time talking about that. It's just such a blatant pain. It, it, it's, it's a loss of the closest thing to you. It's, it's a loss emotionally, psychologically. It's a, it's a loss in every sense. It's a devastation. And, and, and we know that. But for a widow in the first century, it's even more. And I had to really dig into that to really get to know what the rabbi was talking about. Because sometimes you've got to understand his context to understand his point. That's a really important thing about reading the scriptures, is understanding what Jesus is really referring to and what's going on that really makes his point so profound. So a widow in the first century, just like now, is a woman who's lost everything. Who's waking up every morning to a searing pain, just a numbness in her heart, a grief, a loss, a mourning. But she's also, because of the context and the cultural structure of the time, she's also a woman who suddenly found herself at the bottom economically, sociologically, culturally. She hasn't just lost her husband, she's lost her stature. There isn't insurance, there, there, isn't a, there isn't a structure that keeps her where she was before her husband died. She's actually now at the bottom of the pile, regardless of where she was before. There's that quicker loss for, for, for someone in, in the culture. And we, we, we see texts all the way through the scripture that really make out just how painful and just how searing a loss it was to be a widow in, 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 in Bible times, from the Old Testament to the New Testament. You know, James says in, 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 his, in, his, in his writing, True and perfect religion looks like caring for the widow and the, and the orphan. Throughout scripture, the widows are made the point of, hey, if you're going to care for someone, care for the widow. Not just because of her emotional loss, but because of her economical and cultural loss as well. She actually has nothing now. Her inheritance, the inheritance that she would have got from her husband, she loses. Let me read you out this, this small little phrase from a commentary I read a couple weeks ago. It says this, for a widow would have minimal, if any, inheritance rights. She was often in no man's land. She had left her family to be with her husband. So in his death, the bond, the bond between even her, even her and his family was tenuous, if not destroyed. She had left her family for her husband's, but at the loss of her husband, she was no longer associated with his family. So she was in no man's land. I read in another commentary that people that were just at the bottom of the pile, excommunicated sometimes, ostracized, just out of the fold, were referred to as widows, regardless of whether they had lost a husband. It, to be called a widow was just to mean, you're at the bottom. You have lost everything. So there's a, there's a scripture, again, a very like humbling, powerful scripture. This is from... Um, the book of Ruth 1.20 says this. This is, this is Naomi talking to Ruth. And she says, don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me Mara. Because the Almighty has made my life bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. So why call me Naomi? I have been afflicted. The word, the name Mara means bitter. And there was this sense as a widow. And if you've read the book of Ruth, you know it ends very well. <laughs> And everything is restored. It's such, if you need some light reading this week, put down your novels and read the book of Ruth. It's amazing. But it, but it makes the point of, I am now so afflicted, I will rename myself bitter because that's my lot. Widows in the first century as well would wear black constantly to identify themselves as what they had gone through, to identify what, you know, who they were now in culture, bitter, lost everything, nothing left for me, right? Searing pain emotionally, searing grief, but also economical and, and, and cultural loss. This is really important to understand the profound nature of what Jesus is saying. She also, as a widow, if she didn't have any able-bodied children, so if she had young children, she was even worse off because she had so much land often that her husband might have got or a business that her husband might have worked for or started that she had now had to keep up, usually very much indebted. Her kids couldn't work, so she's doing two, three people's jobs sometimes, often very physically just enabled because of what she's having to keep up with. Often, well, most, most commonly a widow wasn't just rock bottom. She's also way below because of the debt she'd inherit from her husband 
and an average a, uh, wage for a widow in the first century for one day's work was two lepta, one sixty-fourth um, of of the of the Roman denarius, right? So one sixty-fourth. That was what she lived on. Two copper coins, two lepta. And so Jesus is sat in the uh, in the courts and he's seeing people putting money into the treasury bo- treasury box. And then this widow comes up and she does it. And he makes this example out of her, makes this moment, calls the disciples around. You've got to look at his widow. She's doing something so profound that people for every generation from this point need to learn about. So once we have the understanding of who she is culturally, we can kind of dig into why this is so important. I read those four lines, four verses. And what I wrote down as a result, what came out of my heart instantaneously was, this woman was not a victim. This woman was not a victim. The widow wasn't a victim. Why is this so profound? Because through our scripture, she is victimized and used as an example of if you're going to give to someone, if someone amongst you is going to be charity, it's the widow, right? Let me read from uh, Deuteronomy really quick. This is Deuteronomy 26. When you finish setting aside a tenth of all your produce in the third year, the third, the year of the tithe, you shall give it to the Levite, the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow. James 1.27, religion that is pure and undefiled before God is this, visit the orphan and the widow in their affliction. She was charity, and yet she gave. And Jesus is watching. As we know about Jesus, he doesn't look at what's in our hands. He looks at what's in our hearts. We know that about him, right? So he's seeing the story within the story at this point. He's seeing a woman that has every right to be a victim live in a moment as a victor. He sees a woman that doesn't allow what's in her hand to define what's in her heart. She see, he sees this woman and makes a glorious example out of her because she exposes a false sense of abundance in everyone else. He says in John 10, I've come to give you life and life in abundance. Parisos. The first sermon I ever preached here was called Parisos. The art of abundance. And, and the point is this, parisos in the Greek means that which exceeds our expectations, that which goes beyond what you've anticipated. That's what Jesus came to bring, right? That life. So it's not a life that is just of possession and wealth and material asset. No, no, it's way more than that. It's abundance of the soul. It's something far deeper. Oh, he's seen people give out the abundance of their pocket many times. But to see someone give out the abundance of their soul, now that's someone that knows God, right? That, now that's an example to make. That's someone to magnify and set apart and say, hey, that's how you're to live. Though she has nothing, she's given. Though she has poverty in her account, she has abundance in her heart. She gave two lepta, two bronze coins. And the, the offering isn't like a little nice cushioned basket that goes around where people put checks and notes in. You can Google it if you want when you get home. It's like a trumpet. It looks like a trumpet. This kind of long horn that runs down to a wooden box. So when you put the coins in, you hear... You ever play those games at the arcade where you like play the two Ps? You try and make the two P spill out all the other two Ps. And hopefully they all spill over and you hear the... The coins. And you kind of hear someone do it and it gets their attention because they're winning. The, the, the offering box was an opportunity to show off, to show people what you were given. If you were given plenty and you were giving a lot of money, you were using a lot of coins and heavy coins. If you were given two lepta, you were given coins lighter than five peas, made of copper that probably didn't make a sound. And if they did, it was even worse because how humbling the sound was. Do you even hear that? So to walk up to the offering box and put these two little coins in was radically humble. It was allowing yourself to be utterly exposed of saying, this is all I have to give. But we know from a widow's wage in the first century, it was all she had to give. It was everything she had to give. She lived day to day. Pound to pound, paycheck to paycheck. She literally woke up in the morning, worked for the day, got that money, lived off it. She went and gave it. It adds new meaning to when Jesus says, Father, give us today our daily bread. Jesus says, this is amazing. Jesus says, don't be anxious about anything. 
That question is probably the most common question of our age. How do I not be anxious? Jesus says, just don't worry. Anything else on that? You want to write a book? Just, just don't worry about anything. Why? This is what he says. He says, don't worry about anything because your Father in heaven takes care of you. And if you need reminding, go outside and look at the flowers of the field. Look at the birds of the air. They neither reap nor sow. They don't toil or stress. They're clothed by your Father in heaven. How much more will he give to those he loves? They don't even practice reaping and sowing. Sowing and reaping. And they're provided for. How much more will he give to you? That's the answer to not being worried. Daily bread. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's got problems. Oh, great. Tomorrow's got its concerns of its own. Just think about today and look to your father. He is enough for you right now, today. And she lives like that. This is a woman who is not a victim. And this is, this is a word that, I, that has been so challenging for my own heart. And I wanted to share this week leading up to Resurrection Sunday, the last point of this series of knowing God. Knowing God revokes our right to remain a ruin. It reestablishes our role in the restoration of all things in this world through the kingdom of God. Knowing God revokes our right to be a victim. Knowing God revokes an identity outside of being a beloved child of God. Brennan Manning puts it like this. You are radically loved by God. Every other self is an illusion. That's who you are. Every other sense of identity is a shadow. So I'm going to read out something that I wrote down in my journal 10 years ago. It's 10 statements that I learned about being a victim. And when the guy, it was at the school of ministry, when the guy got up to tell me about the statements, he said this, if when I read these out, your first thought is that it's about someone else, it's never been more about you. <laughs> so I'm going to read these out, all right? I'm going to read them out, and I'm going to just ask for you just to open up your hands, do whatever you want, just to receive. I'm like, okay, Holy Spirit, I'm going to go through a process of hearing what might be lurking in my soul. Do you remember a few weeks ago, I preached on Psalm 139, did it over two weeks, check your pockets and check your distance, and it was the idea of God, search me and know me. See if you find any hurting way within me and heal me. Perhaps I'm not equipped to diagnose myself. Perhaps the one who created me can diagnose me. That which isn't diagnosed can't be dealt with. That which remains hidden can never be healed. This morning, I want us to recognize if there is the way of the victim within us so we can step into the ways of the victor. You down for that? All right, I'm going to read these out. It's going to be 10 statements. And then after that, I'm going to move on and move on to a new scripture that just brings this whole thing home in an equally challenging manner. All right, here we go. This is, um, this is 10 statements around the victim mentality. 10 statements that have been bouncing around in my heart for 10 years. And I'm still processing them. I'm still working through them. But I can say definitively, I am not the victim I used to be because it was diagnosed and it's been dealt with. So let's do this. Father, as I read out these words, Lord, let's do ministry on root, God. Lord, as I just read out these statements, Lord, if there's anything that resonates true in anyone's heart, including and um, firstly mine, Father, may this be a marking moment where we become free, where we start the journey towards utter freedom of living in all that you paid for us to have in Jesus' name. The victim constantly blames other people or situations for feeling miserable. The victim possesses a life is against me philosophy. The victim is cynical or pessimistic. The victim thinks people are constantly purposely trying to hurt them. The victim refuses to consider other perspectives when talking about problems. The victim believes that they're not responsible for what happens in their life. Others are. The victim enjoys feeling sorry for themselves. The victim attracts others who complain, blame, and feel victimized by life. The victim refuses to analyze self or improve life and take responsibility for actions. 
And I'll be honest, this is the one that has most challenged me throughout the years. The victim is constantly putting themselves down. Yeah, Holy Spirit, just as I've read those out, Lord, if there is any that resonate, God, I pray, Father, that today marks the moment of freedom, not of condemnation, not of shame, but of freedom. Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord to liberate and free in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, this is challenging because I think we all have a bit of it in us. Let's just be honest, right? (laughs) It's challenging because I think if you were really honest, you probably did recognize, yeah, I hear that. I feel that. That makes sense. That's real to me. It's challenging that Jesus chooses a woman to make an example of who has nothing. It's challenging because it exposes all the facades that we have to get people and God's attention, right? It challenges us because it exposes that perhaps we don't believe at the core value, the core state, the core depth of who we are. We we are enough and we have enough just by being who we are. Does that make sense? It's challenging that Jesus uses this widow to make an example of she's the one who has something to give because she has it in her heart. Jesus throughout his ministry is kind of bringing his disciples and us as a result into this idea that we're not victims constantly. Never more so, I don't think, than in John 14. John 14, 18, it's this amazing dialogue. It's the end of Jesus's ministry. It's during this kind of week we're going into. It's one of the last things he says to his disciples. He says, he gathers them around. He says, let your hearts not be troubled. Let your hearts not be troubled. Though I'm going away for a while, I'm coming back. I'm going to go prepare a place for you in my father's house. And in his house, there are many rooms. And one of those rooms are for you. And one of the disciples says, but Jesus, how do we know the way? How do we get there? And Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth and I'm the life. I.e., if you want to get to the father's house, you just got to remind yourself of who I am and what I've done, right? Then another disciple, Philip, pipes up and he says, well, show us the Father, Jesus, and that will be enough. And then Jesus says, Philip, have I been with you so long that you didn't know? I am the Father and the Father is in me and I've revealed him to you. How can you say then, Philip, that you don't know the Father because you've seen him in me? And then he goes on to say in verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans. And he's speaking to these men, two of which are James and John. We know their father is Zebedee. We know they're not physical orphans. He's speaking to the spirit of an age. He says, I will not leave you as orphans. It suddenly got very, very, very personal. I will not leave you as orphans. I will not leave you as people that believe that the world is indifferent, cold, and against you. I will not leave you to believe that if you cry out in the night, no one will hear you. I won't leave you to believe that there is an inheritance in store for you. I won't leave you to believe that life is against you. I won't leave you to believe that you have nothing good. I will come to you. And after that, he went to the cross. He went away for a few days and then he came back. That chapter isn't referring to the second coming, whatever that looks like. It's referring to the resurrection because the resurrection revokes our right to remain a ruin and define ourselves as an orphan or a victim. The resurrection reveals that everything that Jesus said is true. And he said what his father is like. He revealed what his father is like. He revealed what he is like. He revealed who we are. That's why the apostle Paul was able to say with confidence, you no longer have the spirit of fear Cause you no longer have the spirit of slavery you cause it, you drive you back into fear. You have the spirit of adoption that cries forth, Abba, Father. If you go to Jerusalem today, the little children refer to parents as Abba, Abba, Daddy. You no longer have the spirit of fear. You have the spirit that cries out in you, I am loved. The good news, my friend, is good news. There's nothing bad about it. I used to think at some, po- at some point the good news had like footnotes or fine print, small print that made it not so good news. And that's why I felt always challenged to share it. Then I realized, no, the good news reveals that everything I wish was true is not on the surface level, on the deep level. 
what I really believe is true about this existence is that I'm not alone and that I am loved and that I do belong. And as awkward as I sometimes feel and as anxious as I sometimes feel, there are arms around me saying, you're enough. You've got this. I love you. I didn't create you to use you. I created you to enjoy you. That's true. I found myself with someone a couple weeks ago, doesn't know Jesus. And he said, so Josh, you're really involved in the church. Yeah, start talking about faith. I said, bro, let me just tell you the gospel. Let me tell you the good news. Everything that you wish was true, deep down there, is. What do you mean? Well, let me tell you a verse you probably heard. For God so loved the world, for God so loved the world, he gave his son so that we might live. I used to read that as, so for God so hated the world, he killed his son. For God so loved the world, he gave his son. For God so loved the world, he gave us Jesus so that we might live. This is good news. You can stop searching for it. It's, you don't have to live another day of your life like the world is against you, like you live in a cold, indifferent, in, indifferent universe. You live in a universe with a constant pulsing affection, raging affection, and it's directed towards your heart. At any moment of any day for the rest of your life, you can, you can receive the love of God that moves beyond condition and reservation and is for you in this moment as you are and not as you should be. That is the love of the Father. And Jesus knew it, which is why, ready going to our second scripture. Second scripture. All right, here we go. I'm gonna read from um, Luke 19, 28. And when he said these things, he went on ahead going to Jerusalem. But when he drew near to Bethany at the mountain that is called Olive, he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village in front of you where you entering, you'll find a colt tied, which no one has ever sat upon. Unite, untie it and bring it to me. If anyone asks why you're untying it, just say, the Lord is in need of it. <laughs> That's funny. It's like, I'm gonna take this car. Wait, can't take my car. The, the Lord needs it. Don't try that. <laughs> And they brought it to Jesus and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set, Jesus, they set Jesus on it. The disciples picked Jesus up and put him on a donkey. It's a really special moment. And he rode along and they spread their cloaks on the, on the road. And he was, as he was drawing near already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And then some of the Pharisees in the crowd said, teacher, rabbi, rebuke your disciples. And he said, I tell you, if they stay silent, the very stones will start crying out. If they shut up, inanimate objects will fulfill their purpose. The whole order of creation is set towards gratitude because it's good. God said it was. That's why Romans 8, 19 says the whole earth is crying out for the sons of God to be revealed so it can stop fulfilling our purpose to rejoice. The way of the widow, the way of the widow and the way of the lamb is the practice of rejoicing. The practice of recognizing that despite circumstance and context, despite what's going on around us, the whole order of creation is set towards goodness. The Father is still saying what he said in the beginning. It is good. It is good. It is good. It is good. And Jesus, who holds all things together, Colossians holds all things together, is drawing all people, all people to himself, is validating that which has always been true. Look to me, I'm the way, the truth, and the life because I reveal not even death can define how you view this world. I'm preaching this message with problems. Just this week, I'm not going to go into the gory details, but just this week, I really did have to wake up and choose to believe a message I preached a couple weeks ago. I preached a message about the desolate place. Do you remember? When, when Jesus feeds the 5,000, he goes to the desolate place in his grief. And when he gets there, People are there and he has compassion on them and he feeds them and he breaks bread and he, and, he, and he heals them. And when the disciples say, you can't feed anyone here, it's desolate. He says, effectively, I already redefined this place as, as where I was going to eat and where I was going to receive. So I'm going to feed these people. There's no place for Jesus that is too desolate. He can't meet with his father. He doesn't see the world is against him. He sees a father that is for him. Even when he's on his way to the cross. Even on his way to the cross, he doesn't tell his disciples to stop, stop singing because he knows 
the winter is over. The time of singing has come. Yeah, this week's going to be brutal. He knows that. He knows he's going to be betrayed. He knows, he's, he knows all that he's going to go through. But a time of singing has come. They don't know the full extent of what they're singing about, but they're right to be in song. They still think I'm going to overthrow the empire. They don't know I'm overthrowing the empire within them. I'm doing it. And it's good to be singing. Are you with me? Jesus reveals that the Father has the last word on what our life is defined by. And he lives like it right to the end. I read recently, Jesus comes into Jerusalem on a donkey, exemplifying the true extent of love. Defenseless. Love defends, but it's defenseless. It doesn't try and defend itself. Jesus doesn't try and defend himself. Jesus doesn't have a pity party. Jesus goes to the cross, why? For the joy that's set before him. What if, whatever we're walking through, and I'm putting myself in the middle, I'm preaching to my soul, you might be able to tell. What if all that we're going through, what if all that we say we have to endure, we're aware has joy at the other end of it? It says that in Hebrews, Jesus endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. I prophesy this over every soul in this, in this room. There is joy set before you. There is joy set before you. They prophesied it without knowing it. Blessed is he who brings the kingdom. The resurrection is the inauguration of the kingdom of God. There's a new regime, right? There is a new leader. His name is Jesus. He's the king of kings, the Lord of all, and he has the last word. Amen. The good news is good news. And that is all I have to say about that. I, I want to end with this. I want to end with anyone who hasn't had communion to come and receive communion. We're going to sing a song of us, Danny, is sing called I Am No Victim. And it's a declaration of everything that I've said. I've listened to the song many times and just cried because it's so hard to sing sometimes when you're so aware of what you're going through. But when you sing these words and we take bread and wine or you receive prayer, you allow the truth of the cross to eclipse every other way that you've defined yourself. Amen. And I am not in any way, you know, dumbing down what we go through and what we've been through. I'm not dumbing it down. I'm just saying over your life, the story isn't over. It doesn't have the last and final word. Just on communion, as we close, when Jesus gave us communion and he said, take this wine and this bread and do it in remembrance of me. It was a very potent, very prophetic moment. He takes the grapes, right? The wine, the grapes. And a few chapters earlier, I mean, really literally a few days earlier in the timeline, he's in John 15. He's probably walking by a vineyard and he makes the point of what happens to fruit, to, 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 to branches that bear fruit. The father prunes them, right? If it's fruitful, the father prunes them so it bears more fruit. He takes the wine and he's saying, look, there was a time that these grapes were on a tree and they were then pruned. The fruit was taken off. And the fruitfulness wasn't the extent of their destiny. Because what happened after their fruitfulness was their pressing down, their crushing. But that wasn't the end either. Because after they were pressed and crushed down, they were resurrected and they were turned into wine. Woof! And he takes the bread and what does he do? He breaks it. Just like he did at the feeding of the 5,000. Because that which is broken gets multiplied. In a time where bread wasn't bought from the shops, but flour was beaten and then the, the dough was kneaded and he breaks it and he says, remember when you eat bread, remember the process of bread, the breaking, but then the rising. Eat this in remembrance of me. Remember that the breaking and the pressing doesn't have the final word. You will rise again. You will flow again. All will be restored. The good news is good news. Why don't we stand together? Oh, Father, I just thank you this morning that knowing you changes everything. Do you believe that this morning? Knowing God changes everything. Lord, I thank you for this season of knowing more of who we are and whose we are. 
Lord, I thank You that the closer we get to knowing who You really are, the more liberated we become. Lord, I thank You that the closer we get to the true extent of Your character, the more revealed we are. We are sons, we are daughters, we are victors, we are not orphans or victims. And Lord, I thank You for every person in the room today that has started a journey from victimhood to victor. Lord, wherever someone resonated with a sense of, yeah, I've been living bound and chained. God, I thank You that today marks the moment of liberation. I thank You that this week, I prophesy over this week, I declare over this week that it will be a week that manifests freedom and liberation. That when we come at Resurrection Sunday, we don't come here just to talk about historical event. We come here to testify about the reality of what's happening amongst us today. Lord, I thank You that when we take communion, when we receive the bread and the wine, we remember that the breaking and the pressing or the crushing doesn't have the final word. We thank You that You involve us in Your story. That not even death, not even death gets to put the full stop on our story. I thank You that the author isn't fear, the author isn't shame. The author of our story isn't anyone other than the Father in whom there are no shifting shadows.